Hello everyone and welcome back to Strategy Gaming Dojo where we find, learn, and play one more turn of the great strategy games. As promised, we are going to kind of look at, do an introduction, I wouldn't even call it a tutorial, we're kind of just going to look at the basics of John Tiller games. All of John Tiller games from Pike and Musket all the way to Cold War Gone Hot, uh, Panzer campaigns, uh, the Civil War campaign games, Napoleonic campaigns, Revolutionary War, all of them are essentially played with the same system. Now there are, of course, there are going to be little tweaks and changes and whatnot, but once you learn one of these games, you will have a door open to you for playing pretty much every conflict um in modern history and back to you know what the 15 15 1600 so you will have a lot open to you um if you learn the system and it's not a difficult system i know it can be intimidating because of all these buttons up here but they're easy to learn now why haven't more people jumped into the tiller games well for one thing there is a big player base out there uh, that loves these games and uh, you know they've got their own Facebook page they've got their own fan pages and stuff so they there is a group of people that play these games and there are clubs where you can find opponents if you want to play another human um, for all the different genres so there are some people really into his Napoleonic games there are some really into his Civil War games the Panzer campaign games are actually really popular uh, all hitting on every front campaign uh, in World War II. Um, so they're a little more popular than maybe you think. And two, the reason they're not even more popular than that are the graphics. And that's always been a problem with Tiller games. Luckily, he has partnered, contracted with, I don't know what the relationship is exactly, with a War Game Design Studio. And these guys have done a really, really nice job of bringing his games up to the current visual possibilities. Let's put it that way. Um, John Tiller games, you're never going to play them because of the graphics. And I understand that. I think he understands that. When you look at them, I think you understand that. Um, but these guys at War Game Design Studio have at least made the games playable. I told the story last time how the first time I got a Tiller game, I, I just gave up. You know, I, I mean, you couldn't tell what was going on. It wasn't any fun. Now, these games now have all been brought up to what they're calling their gold standard um you know, their definitive standard, uh, whatever. You know, they call them the gold standard in the Panzer campaigns. I forget what they call them for the Civil War and Napoleonic games, uh, but they've done the same. You know, they brought them up to where you have really good 2D. I never played the 3D, but if you do, I mean, I think they look passable now. You know, there's, it's not going to be animated where you see troops firing. It's not Scourge of War, if that's what you're looking for. But by the same token, this is a board game, a very well-researched board game, um, all about the campaigns in and around the battlefield at Antietam. Um, for our little playthrough here, so when I say playthrough, we're just going to touch the basics. We're going to go through and talk about each of the basics of the game system, how it works, you know, give you an idea of how John Tiller games unfold. So for that, as you can see, I'm flipping here through all of the scenarios. You have weather scenarios, um, and you have these AI challenge scenarios. We're going to play this one, 144, just to show you. Now, we're not going to play the whole Thing. I'm not going to play all 45 turns. I'm going to use this to show you all the buttons, what they do, how they work. I'm going to show you how to move, how to fire both infantry and artillery. We're just going to go through the basics. So we're going to do the AI challenge, meaning they've built up the AI here for you, you know, to give you a challenge. Get it? Uh, bull run historical. 
So essentially the AI is going to be doing what the Union did during the Battle of Bull Run. So challenge, it's 45 turns for this scenario. Uh, this AI challenge scenario should be played as the South. Following the failed attack on the 18th on Blackburn's Ford, which is another scenario, you can see here AI challenge Blackburn's Ford, um, General McDowell formed the following plan. Richardson's brigade would make a false attack on Blackburn's Ford, boom, to the south. Tyler's division is to move from Centerville towards the Stone Bridge on Warrington Turnpike. We'll go look at that in a minute. A feign for the main attack. The divisions of Hunter and Heinzelman will leave camp and diverge from the Warrington Turnpike at the by road beyond Cub Run and take the road for Sudley Springs. These two divisions will launch the main attack on the Confederate flank, uh, and then Miles' division will stay at the Centerville Ridge. Okay, that all sounds good. We're going to play normal. Status new. Normal. Uh, this uh, I'm not even sure what this means. I always played new. Uh, normal, you could play, um, play by email. You could play a two-player hot seat. A lot of people play this game by email. Uh, so we're going to pick this. It was designed by Richard Walker. Bull Run, July 21st, 1861. Now the Union is going to be the AI, so that's going to be automatic. Uh, what does this mean? Manual means you're controlling it. Commander control means you're going to tell your commanders kind of what you want them to do. Think of it as, you know, your kind of Beauregard, and you can tell each of your commanders an idea of what their orders are. I'll be honest with you, I've never played that way before. I always play Supreme Commander on manual. Um, automatic means that you're going to be playing the AI with no fog of war, and then automatic with fog of war. So that's what we're going to pick for the Union AI. We're going to be controlling the Confederacy. Now, what do you have here? This gives the AI buffs if you move it towards the con or uh, for towards the Union, so away from you, and this is kind of like the percentage buff uh, in increments of 10, uh, but it's really kind of like medium or uh, low, medium, you know, high. So let's do medium. Uh, we will give the Union a nice advantage. Now, I've had some people ask me, what about the AI in these games? And I'm not going to tell you that the AI is... Uh, on a level where you're going to say, holy smoke, I can't believe how smart it is. What the AI will do is react not dumbly to your moves. So it's not going to, it's going to kind of play historically. And that's why I play, you saw in those parentheses, it said H-I-S-T when we picked the scenario. That essentially means that the union is going to play a historical game it's not going to decide it's going to put all of its troops at Blackburn's Ford, even though that's not what the Union did. Instead, it's going to go around. So if you know the history of the battle and you play historical, you're kind of going to, you're kind of going to know what the AI is going to do because it will follow that historical model. I mean, if you want a complete surprise, don't play that scenario. Uh, but for many people, they don't know exactly, you know, how each battle unfolded. Just kind of click through and don't read the description we just read. Because now, of course, we know where the Union troops are going, uh, but you don't have to do that. You know, we could go back, click on the, uh, you know, Battle of Bull Run AI Challenge, and just not even read that box, right? So automatic with Fog of War, um, and then we have rules. We're not going to do that this time. I'm going to do that in a separate episode. The reason being, I don't want to just jump into the rule book with you right away. I'd rather we get some graphics up and start looking at them. Okay, so the Union is going to play first, and you'll see the wheel. The wheel's kind of spinning here. We could not move any of our troops if we tried. Now, we are seeing our troops, and we're going to scoot out to our our biggest extent and we're also going to bring up the jump map so this these are all of the hexes that are in the bull run you know region 
where the Battle of Bull Run took place. Now you can see this is a road, this is the Warring, Warrington Turnpike that was mentioned in our summary. This yellow, these are little towns or villages. Uh, this is Centerville right here. Um, a lot of history in Centerville, of course. Okay, and now we see the AI has played its turn. So it's the Confederate turn. So as you can see, you can kind of mess around here while the AI is doing its thing. Now you may want to watch it, especially once the action picks up a little bit. Uh, but for this first turn, you know, of course, this is the map that we're actually playing. When you play other scenarios um, here, you may be in this portion of the map or over here. You know what I mean? Like, obviously, if you played war games, you get it. This is the map that we're playing right here. So you've got this jump map. I just brought it up here from view. As you'll notice, his games have the uh, windows, I guess, yeah, you know, Apple is kind of the same way, but it's really kind of the Windows menu system um, where you have all of these choices. You do not have to really ever use this if you don't want to, because all of the choices that are here are here in buttons. And not only are they here in buttons, they also have hotkeys. So you'll see here, previous stack, P. When it says P next, that P next to it in um, in the brackets, that is the hotkey. So when you say next stack is N, you know we can flip through just like every good war game, right? You can flip through all of your stacks that you could possibly move in this turn by hitting N. Uh, if you miss one or you want to go back, you can hit P, and so. Even though you have all of these buttons and all of these menus and all of those hotkeys, they're all kind of the same thing. If you just learn this button, these buttons, you can play the game. You really har hardly ever have to go up here. I, I don't even, I don't think there are any of these really, except for maybe the help that you would have to go uh, deal with. And it's not like you have to memorize all the hotkeys again. Every one of these buttons, melee odds, uh, you could, if you learn that and you just get used to meleeing, you could hit Control O, or you know you could just hit this button. And this is one thing that War Game Design Studio has done. Now Tiller always had these buttons, but they believe me when I say they were not nearly, nearly this well organized. Um, they were not, uh, they didn't look as nice. It wasn't always clear what they are or what they, what you're looking at. Now I'm extreme, you know, extremely zoomed out here in the 2D mode. This is as far out as you can get from the map other than the jump map. So you saw the jump map um, and you can either have these on or have these off. I, of course, always have them on because I like them. These are the labels that kind of tell you where you are. So you see, you know, here's Bull Run. Now this is the Battle of Bull Run. Uh, spoiler alert, the Bull you know, I don't think a lot of people know this. Run just means kind of like a smaller, kind of like a creek uh, in the north. I think maybe they're more often called creeks or, uh, you know, it's a small, it's not a river. Let's put it that way. Um, and so you've got Bull Run here. We've got, you can see we've got forces here. Uh, we've got some forces here up by these fords. You see the Bull Run, you know, picks up back over here. And on we go. And so we've got forces here. This is the Stone Bridge. Uh, the Warrington Turnpike is moving through here. Uh, and Sudley Springs is here. So if you're familiar with the Battle of Bull Run, you know where I'm talking about. The North brings two groupings of soldiers here, right? They they bring a group of soldiers here as kind of a... It's not a feint, really. I mean, they're pushing this way, but the main attack comes here from the north. And they feint over here by Blackburn's Ford. Uh, and so this is, you know, the map of Bull Run. Now let's talk about this map a little bit. So I've zoomed in one magnification 
and you can see this looks this looks all right right i mean it's not the greatest graphics you've ever seen but if you like hex encounter if you like board games uh war war game on the board uh this is what you see you're going to like these games now it did not used to look this good you can go one more in and now we're right down into the thick of it so we're looking at that blackburn's ford i'm just doing this with the mouse wheel you can also do it with the one two three four and five keys and why do i say five because we've seen you know max out kind of medium 2d uh zoomed in 2d the reason it keeps popping up, let's move our cursor over here now you can go to the 3d if you want this is the zoomed out 3d again not my cup of tea but some people like it if you like it you know play this way it's yeah it can be kind of cool uh and then you have your zoomed in so you know you've got your uh long streets over here with uh the fifth north carolina there in this hex okay you know, I mean, you could definitely play the game this way. His games did not used to be that way. But I always play 2D. I generally play kind of like medium zoom to start with and look around once I'm oriented with the map. Um, and then I'll zoom in when I, you know, pinpoint what I want. Now, what are these Confederate flags? These are the objectives for this battle. And that's how you partially win his games so you want to hold the objectives and there are a list of those and we'll go to those in a second uh well i say a second maybe this episode maybe not i'm going to try to hold these to about 30 minutes um but this confederate flag is an objective and that will give you obviously a pretty good sense of what we're trying to do what we're trying to hold the other way that you can win is you know killing troops uh, you know, destroying guns, killing cavalry, you get points for all of those things. Uh, but we'll get into that. It's not entirely important. I really want to kind of focus on the map this time. Now you'll see we've got trees. Uh, we've got what appears to be a run or a river here in dark blue. And we've got a Ford. Every one of these that are lighter blue is called a Ford. What does that mean? In the Civil War game, um, and this also translates to the World War II game where there are bigger rivers uh, and whatnot, but in the Civil War games, I should say, because they're all like this, the dark blue, you could not cross. Okay, so this is impassable um, on this map, this dark blue. The lighter blue, the fords, you can move over and across um, and that's why you see here we've got all of our troops massed at these fords where the union could potentially try to get through now they could stand over here on the other side of the river and shoot at us depending on their range um, and you know that's fine obviously bullets can pass over blue you know no matter how blue something is if it's within range they can fire bullets at you but it's the light blue that you can move across okay so you see again we have all of our southern troops focused here because if the north is going to move this way this is a road and here's the only place they can cross they can't cross here uh they can't cross here uh, they can't even, you know, they can't cross. Well, here's one little spot. And as you can see, this is an objective. So, hey, light bulb, it's possible the north may try to move some troops around this way and take this forward to pour across and get behind us, right? Uh, just makes sense. If we zoom out again here, you can see some of the other objectives. There's one here on top of this, what appears to be a hill. Now, hopefully you can see these elevations. They're easy for me to see now because I'm used to them. I think that you can tell where they are. I think that you can really tell where they are when you zoom in here and you can see, you know, this kind of contouring. Now we can select how we want these shown. Uh, you can also select up here to show the actual elevation 
that each of these are. So there's no question, you know, if you're like, is this above this or below this, whatever, you can click on that button. I'm not going to do the buttons just yet. I'm just telling you that you can do that. Also, when you click on a hex over here to the left, now you can choose to have this on the left, the right, the top, or the bottom. I've always played these games with them on the left. That's just what I'm used to, you know, so I'm going to play with them on the left. If you want to do something different, it makes absolutely no difference. It's all just, you know, your personal preference. But when you click on one of these hexes, now, just to give you an idea, one of these hexes in the Civil War game and the campaigns is 125 yards. So I always think of these as being like a football field, right? Football field from goalpost to goalpost anyway, uh, if you're American, you'll know what I'm talking about, is 120 yards. So this hex from here to here, or from here to here, or here to here, is 125 yards, if that gives you some kind of sense of perspective of what we're talking about. Um, but when you click on the hex, it will tell you the kind of terrain. So we've got clear 0%. 0% is the combat mod modifier. If you were attacking into this hex, your penalty would be 0%. Just like every other war game in the world, that's your baseline, right? Clear hex, clear terrain, 0%. Its elevation is 200 feet. And then it says ammo here, 1222. Don't really worry about that. I mean, there are supply depots here, but for the most part, unless you get into a big scenario, and when I the World War II game has some scenarios that are, you know, 200, 300 turns. For the, for the Civil War game, you don't really have any that are that big. I mean, Gettysburg is big, of course. I think Antietam that's with us here in this game, Campaign Antietam, of course. Uh, I think that that's like, oh, shoot, I want to say it's 45 turns. You're not going to be worrying about supply so much, and this is really what this has to do with. Now, if you did get into a game, the game will tell you in the design notes uh, but that's beyond what we're doing here. So anyway, it tells you elevation. Now let's go over here and click on the woods. Now you see forest, negative 40%. That's your combat modifier in this hex. If you're attacking into this hex, you're going to have a 40% penalty. Uh, the elevation's 200 feet. Again, we have this ammo. And then it tells you cav disruption. What does that mean? It means if cavalry moves into this, it is going to get disrupted, which is the number one thing you have to think about when it comes to units. Now, I'm going to do units in the next uh, episode. Uh, this time, we're just kind of doing the map. But, you know, cav disruption makes sense, right? When you look at a Ford here, uh, you'll read, or I will tell you, since you're not reading the rule book, when you go across to Ford, your units also get some disruption. Um, they can also be disrupted for other things. If there were breastworks out here, entrenchment, um, if they change elevation too much too fast, they can get disrupted for all of those things. But we'll go into that more uh, when we do units. Um, now you see this plus Holden, what does this mean? This is the level of research for this game. This is like the Holden farm back in 1861. And they're just kind of letting you know, hey, that's the Holden farm. <laughs> you see the little farmhouse here, right? Butler. Looks like Butler had a much nicer home. That's kind of cool. You see the branch rail line. Now, actually, this 3D kind of shows this stuff better, you know, as far as like it being forest and what all this is. You've got a road here, the Manassas Centerville Road. Uh, branch line to Centerville. This is obviously railroad. Um, let's go up here to Centerville. You got a town, you know, Centerville looking kind of nice. They do try to show you the elevations here. The lighter it gets, obviously, the higher it is. The darker green it gets, you know, the, the lower it is in elevation. And as I move around here, maybe you can start to kind of see the elevations. Now, you say, well, you know, how, okay, this is an orchard, 
an orchard. This is something different, right? I could just tell this was an orchard because I know the graphics of this game. An orchard is negative 10% uh, for the combat modifier, but it also makes your cavalry disrupt. So, you know, guys on foot, infantry could walk into this hex. That's fine. If cavalry gets in here, it's going to disrupt them. Makes sense, right? It's an orchard. The horses kind of get spread out. You're trying to avoid branches. All right. Uh, I'll just leave it there. Um, you know, so the Centerville branch, that's all clear. I'm not going to go through a ton more. Uh, I do want to kind of end this episode talking about the map and the terrain by looking at something over here. So the help file is not something you have down here in the buttons. I mean, maybe there's some way to get to it, but I would always just hit up here. You have general help, which will bring you to where you can search the rule book. Uh, they've done a good job of updating recently kind of the general big rule book for all the Civil War games, and then the kind of, uh, you know, independent rule book for each game that talks about scenario no or design notes for those scenarios and, you know, about Antietam. It's got some nice pictures of the battlefields there, stuff like that. Um, so they've updated these, and it's very easy to find the information that you want to find. But what I wanted to bring to you, so you see the campaign notes here, general help for you know questions about the rules of the game uh user's manual which goes into more specific things uh getting started they'll kind of tell you hey what do you do first of all uh when you start the game but what i'm bringing you to here is parameter data and now this is what makes this game system so flexible and it could span over five or six hundred years of time and you can still play the same game system. It's the perfect kind of hex system. Every one of these hexes has certain qualities. And if you think about it, that really kind of makes sense historically. Now, if you fought a battle out here in, you know, 1800, it should kind of be the same as if you, uh, the terrain anyway, and everything in this hex should kind of be the same as it is in 1950. Except you could move faster in 1950, let's say, and that's what these parameters do. It tells you all of the different parameters for every hex and every unit <clears throat> in the game, but it's very, very uh, intuitive simple to figure out what's going on and to figure out, oh, I see how they could leverage this to a World War II game because they would just tra change these values. Um, so you have, you know, Campaign Antietam, First Side Union goes first in this scenario. That's fine. Time parameters, dawn to dusk. Okay. How long the day turns are, night turns. Now, see, you can adjust these things if you were a scenario designer for a World War II game or for um, a futuristic game, you know, any kind of game, you could start to change these. Hours of Twilight. Twilight visibility is four hexes for all of the Civil War games. So they think you can see about 500 yards at twilight. Um, it will also tell you what the max visibility is during daylight uh, as we get down in here. Stacking parameters, again, this is the, the max that you can have in a hex, the max number of men you can have in a hex. A strength point goes to artillery, how much uh, one point or one gun of artillery is considered for strength purposes. Command distances, so you have commanders out here. If it's a brigade commander, to have his units in command, three hexes, division six, core 12, Army 28, okay? So, for instance, well, I'm going to do that next time when we do units. Um, so the Union and the Confederates could have different values for these things. Now, they don't, but they could. Fatigue, fatigue is very important when we get into units, and we'll talk about that next time. But you'll see here, you know, night recovery, night movement penalty. So during the Civil War, there was not a lot of movement at night. Usually units, you know, camped 
and they would fight again the next day, <laughs> which seems kind of strange to us now, but they would retreat to their camps. So you're going to get a huge penalty if you're trying to move around in the night. Um, you know, night attack penalty, 300. We'll talk about all this stuff, but movement parameters is the last thing I wanted to talk about for this episode. Um, you see here, movement parameters, infantry allow 12. Okay, that means that every infantry unit is going to start with 12 movement points at the start of each turn, generally. I mean, uh, there may be some situation where it doesn't, but 99% of the time, it's going to cost you, or you're going to have 12 movement points when the round starts for every infantry unit. Cavalry is going to have 20, artillery is going to have 12, your supply wagons are going to have 10. Those are the only kind of units in the game. You only have to worry about four different kinds. Supply, artillery, cavalry, infantry. If you're playing a World War II game, you're going to have infantry, armor, artillery, and supply. For the most part. Now, you may have some anti-tank in there that work like artillery. We'll talk about that if we ever play a World War II game here. But it's the same basic idea skirmishers you know it's a it's a civil war game so you may want to move skir skirmishers out which you can do in this game cost you three movement points for that unit okay line infantry movement cost so this tells you how much it's going to cost to move through each different kind of hex so let's go look at orchard and we will find it somewhere it's going to cost you three movement points to move through orchards okay rough four clear two i mean it's just very it's very simple when you get into it you can always pull up this param parameter data instead of going to read a rule book somewhere if you played war games before you're like okay i'm going to move from here to here it's a clear hex I'm moving into. That's going to cost me two movement points. I had 12 with this infantry unit. Now I have 10. Pretty simple, right? I mean, that's that's how the system works. Forest counts five. A field is two. You can't move over pikes. That's what this is telling you. If there's a fence in there, it adds one. If you're changing elevations, it adds one. See, it's all very important intuitive and then you can look line uh, and we'll get into this with units your unit your infantry units can either be in a line or they can be in a column and then this tells you all your different movement costs if they're in a col column same with cavalry artillery and you can look down here you can bring this up it's very simple and say how much is this going to cost me so a supply wagon to go through force is going to cost me eight mo movement points and you know that um, also in this game, you can change the direction that your units face. We'll talk about that next time. And that is how many points it costs if you change the way they're facing. If you turn them all the way around and do an about face, that's how much it's going to cost. If you change their formation from line to column or column to line, that's how much it's going to cost. All of these... In, all of these things are spelled out, so you really don't have to go read a rule book. You can look right here and it'll tell you everything. And these will be maybe a little different based on scenarios um, and a little bit different if you play a World War II game or if you play a Napoleonics game. But this is how his game system works. And when we come back next time, I'm going to talk about movement and firing and the different kinds of units uh, and kind of putting all of this into practice. But we'll always be going back up here to look at the parameter data because it just gives you so much information. So as always, thank you so much for joining me. I, I hope that I get, you know, if I can just get one person to try out these John Tiller games again, I will consider this a success. I think they're great games now. Uh, they were really good games before. They just were hard to look at <laughs> it's basically uh and so now i think they're definitely worth your time 
so, you know, hopefully you'll continue to join me on these episodes because I intend to put out about five of the basics. And heck, who knows, we may even play Bull Run here just because I like the game. So until next time, thank you from Strategy Gaming Dojo. I do appreciate it. I'll talk to you next time.